I went to the best restaurant in Canada by accident. I wasn't planning on it. This was during my honeymoon with my wife. I just looked online at some restaurants in the area, what was close, what had some good reviews, what wasn't too expensive. Picked a spot and we went for dinner with some friends. Because there was a few of us, we bought a couple appetizers off the menu. One of the things that we got was a seafood tower. Wife likes seafood. And so it had crab and squid and lobster and oysters and smoked salmon and sushi and ceviche. And I took I took one bite of this seafood tower, and this has never happened before. I took one bite, and I just leaned back and closed my eyes. It was that good that it almost, like, it just, it just shut me down. I was overwhelmed with how good this food tasted. And every single bite that I took of that whole tower, it hit me that hard. I would take one bite and just drop my hands and savor that flavor for like a minute. It was, it was emotionally satisfying and exhausting. I felt like I was listening to a symphony and watching a sunset and having a massage at the same time. And so we finished this whole seafood tower, one of the most incredible sensory experiences of my life. And then the staff came out and started bringing more appetizers. And when they brought out the food, I thought, oh no. I don't, have the, I don't have the emotional capacity to handle more food. And they brought out this wild mushroom tart and this elk tartare and that. And then I noticed something. There was a table on the other side of the restaurant and they also ordered these same appetizers as us, but they were doing this. They were all just they were, they were just staring at their phones oblivious to this thing that was in front of them. And I almost yelled across the restaurant, almost. It was on the honeymoon, had a little bit more filter. But I wanted to yell at them and say, hey, hey, don't you see this thing, this incredible thing right in front of you? This is, this is going to change your life. What are you doing looking at your phones? Look at this incredible thing. And they missed it. Maybe you're like this with pictures of your kid. Right? You're at work and you're showing everyone a picture of your kid. Look at my kid. Look at him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice. That's nice. No, look at my kid. Or they make you a, a craft, a picture at school, and you're showing it to, to all your friends, your colleagues. Look at this picture. I made them. They made this picture. I, I partially made this picture. Look at this thing. Or you're showing everyone a picture of your dog on Halloween. You Look, he's Batman. Look at my dog. He's Batman. <laughs> this, this frustration, this worry that people might miss something incredible that's right in front of them. Now, in a very loosely similar way, this is what the Apostle Paul is doing in the final part of the book of Romans. If we think of book of Romans, the book of Romans, like a symphony, chapter eight is one of the peaks, one of the crescendos of this symphony of the book of Romans. This final part of the chapter is the very height of that crescendo of the whole book of Romans. Paul has been giving this beautiful and, and multi-layered description of us as humanity, our position, and God, and his holiness, and his justice, and how we're in need of redemption, and how he sent his son, and we receive right standing with God because of what happened through Jesus. And he's laying all these things out, and he wants us to see the significance and the implications of this. And to do so, He's going to ask several rhetorical questions. He's going to ask questions that he wants us to answer. And as we answer these questions, we're going to be connecting the dots and seeing the beautiful truths that come out of this. So Paul is going to ask you six questions today. So let's dive right into it. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 31. Verse 31 says this, what then shall we say to these things? When he says to these things, he means everything that he's laid out in Romans chapter 8. And Romans chapter 8 is kind of responding to the several chapters of Romans beforehand. So think everything Paul has said, everything he's been laying out. What then shall we say to these things? What do you say? How do we respond to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's the first rhetorical question. If God is for us, who can be against us? And what would you say? What's the answer? No one. That's the answer that Paul's going for here. No one is the expected answer, which is 
It's kind of wild if you read this, because if you look at the Apostle Paul, he has been whipped, given lashings, five different times, and each time he received 39 lashings. He's also said that he was beaten with rods three different times. He said that he's been thrown in jail and imprisoned so many times that he lost count. And you say, you really think no one can be against you? Paul, did you forget something? And he, No, of course not. Verse 28 of Romans chapter 8 says that all things work together for good for those who are called according to God's purpose. So everyone else is in it for themselves, but God is in it for us. And that's really good news. God is for you, you who are in Christ, now. He's not... Uh, for you in the future. You know, he's not just waiting for a future version of you and then God will be for you. He's not sitting around kind of annoyed and patiently thinking, I wish Sawyer would just get his stuff together because then I can love him, then I can actually transform him and do some good things through his life. He isn't tolerating you. He isn't putting up with you. God is for you now. And so that's how Paul can say, if God is for us, no one can be against us. And if we look at the lives of the apostles, how they modeled this, how they were persecuted and counted all as gain. Many times they were locked up. So the leaders would say, we're going to lock you up. And they'll say, no problem. I'll convert your guards and I'll sing hymns of praise. Okay, well then we're going to beat you. I might know Christ and his sufferings. Okay, we're going to kill you. To live as Christ, to die as gain. So who can be against God's people? No one. If the Almighty is for you, it doesn't matter who is against you. So that's the first question. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. Now let's look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So there's two propositions here. The first is a question. Will he not give us all things? The answer is, he will. Yes, he will. Paul's making this argument from the greater to the lesser. If God did this, certainly he can do this. If God can lift a stone that weighs a million pounds, he can lift a stone that weighs 10 pounds. And do you see the weight of the stone in this sentence? If God can give up his own son, how can he not give us all that we need? And if you look at the particular word here, it uses the word spare. He who did not spare his own son. Most scholars say that this word spare, it's actually a connection to the same word that's used in Genesis 22, 12. When Abraham did not spare his own son, Isaac. Isaac was supposed to die by the hand of his father. And God provided a substitute. And that happened on Mount Moriah. It's kind of this mountainous region. And many, many years later, God would provide the ultimate substitute for those who were to perish through his son, Jesus. Also in the same mountainous regions of Mount Moriah. So the book of Romans says that the wages of sin are death. That we choose to live our lives, not as God would have us do it, but as how we would want to do it. We don't Treat God as our Lord. We want to be our own gods. We set up our own little Sawyer-sized, your-sized thrones on your heart, and we want to do things our own way. And the consequence of living like this is that it leads to death and wrath. So Jesus comes, lives the life we cannot live, and pays our price, takes on God's wrath and death so that we can have his status in being in right standing with God as a member of his family. And when we think about Jesus dying in our place, it's important to not fall into the mistake of thinking, wow, Jesus died for me, I must be so precious. It's not that we're precious, it's that God is gracious. It's not that we're great, God is gracious. There's the, the joke about dogs and cats. Um, if, uh, if you take care of a dog, your dog thinks, wow, they feed me, they love me, they take care of me, they must be God. But a pet cat, they think, wow, they feed me, they love me, they take care of me, I must be God. Do you know that joke? If you stare into your cat's eyes, you can see Satan. But it's important in theology. You, you can think of theology as dog theology or cat theology. 
Jesus died for us, not because we are great, but because he is gracious in this way. So it was a piece of cake for God to give us all that we needed because he already gave up his son. That's the hardest thing. And when it says, give us all things, is this the, the prosperity gospel and talking about giving us all things? Is, God, is uh, Paul talking about God giving us the car we always wanted, the spouse we always wanted, the house, the career that we always wanted? Does it mean we'll never get cancer? Not at all. Verses 35 and 36, we'll talk about famine and poverty. So what is he talking about giving us? He's talking about giving us everything that we need to be conformed in the image of Christ. Everything that we need to do God's will. Everything that we need to live righteously. Everything that we need to make it home to glory. There's several promises that God offers to his people in the Old Testament, Israel. And these are expanded to all of the church in the New Covenant. Here's six, but there's many. Here's six such examples. First is the Holy Spirit. Israel was promised the Spirit to keep the law, but this promise comes to fruition in the church. Second, Israel had the promise of the future resurrection, and Paul speaks of the resurrection of all believers. Three, Israel was said to be God's son, but now Christians are said to be members of God's family. That's that image of adoption. Here's three more. Israel was promised an inheritance. Now this is extended to the church, not just a specific plot of land, but the new kingdom of heaven, which we will inhabit. Five, Israel was God's people and the only foreknown among the nations. And now the church is said to be foreknown by God. Little side point, verses 28, 29, 30, use some of this language of being foreknown and elect and predestined. And I'm choosing now not to dive into all of the intricacies and implications of that language because all of chapter 9 is going to be deep in these waters. So for now, we're going to bracket some of those concepts and we will return to them thoroughly in the following messages. All right. And the final promise is God promised never to forsake Israel and he extends this promise to the church. So will God give us all things? He will all of these promises. If God gave his son to save you, there's nothing he won't give to keep you. That's what we learn in verse 32. Now let's continue on. Verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So this is the next question. Who will bring a charge? What's the answer? No one. It is God who is the judge and he is also the one who has justified you. So who else is there to do it? But even Jesus, he was in court and charges were brought against him, accusations. The key is this, no one can make them stick. These charges, it's the same word for accusation. The devil may accuse you. People may accuse you. No one can make it successful, not even yourself. Maybe you look at your past and you see the horrible things you've done and you think, maybe I'm too screwed up. Maybe I've done too many horrible things. Maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe I'm not talented enough. Maybe I'm not good enough or impressive enough to be used by God. But it is God who justified you. God has justified you. He has declared that you are righteous, no longer guilty, but Christ paid the price. And now he declares that you are righteous, not because you are great, but because he is gracious. Gracious. God is the highest court of appeal. So if the Supreme Court declares you innocent, you can't be held guilty by any other lower court. No slander on social media is successful. No accusations by your friends or your family or your enemies or yourself work at all. So I would say there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No nagging of your conscience. I love the example of the woman caught in adultery in the Gospels. There's a story of a woman caught in adultery and she's dragged before Jesus. They don't, they don't drag the guy before Jesus. It smells like a setup. It smells like a trap. They drag her before Jesus and they say, look at this woman we caught in adultery. What ought we do? And the crowd around was picking up stones to, to publicly execute her in this way. And it says that Jesus he didn't say anything. He knelt down and he wrote something the sand with his finger. We don't know what it is that he wrote. He wrote something. He stood up and he said, let he who is without sin 
cast the first stone. And it says one by one, the men that dragged this woman forward, the crowd, they dropped their stones and they walked away. And this woman now who thought she was about to face a slow, painful death looks up to see that her accusers are gone. Jesus says, if they don't condemn you, neither do I. There was only one person there without sin and he chose not to condemn her. He showed her grace and he said, go and sin no more. Now, this grows. One more layer to this. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So there's the question, who can bring a charge against you? That's an accusation. This is, who can condemn? Who can condemn you, write you off? What's the answer? No one. There's three reasons that are given. Christ died, Christ rose, and Christ intercedes. Three things happen. He is at the right hand of God. He is now interceding for us. That's why verse 1 of chapter 8 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? The condemnation was endured by Jesus himself. He's been raised from the dead. He was vindicated, right? Because if he only died... Many people have claimed to be prophets and messengers of God or God himself, and they all died. And only one was raised from the dead, vindicated, shown to be the true Son of God. He died, he rose, and now he sits at the right hand of God, interceding for his people. There's two examples of this. The first is Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Jesus is talking to Peter, Simon Peter, and he says, Simon, Simon, behold... Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That is terrifying. John 17, verses 14 to 17. This is Jesus' long priestly prayer for his people. He's praying to God for his people. I have given them, us, your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. So now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The old has gone and the new has come. Your old self has died with Christ, and has now been raised to him, we have the new life, the same new life that Christ shares. Maybe you think, okay, but on the day of judgment, uh, there's still going to be some things that are going to be brought up, right? Hey, what about this? And on that day, Christ will be interceding for you, saying, I paid for that. Okay, but what about this thing I did? Yeah, I I paid for that. What about this thing that I said? Yeah, I I paid for that. What about this, this person that I hurt? I paid for that. I paid for that. I paid for that. I paid for that with my life. So who is there to condemn? No one. The only person who can judge you is Jesus. And he was judged for you on the cross. Thus far, we've seen the implications of our status legally. Paul's been laying out these arguments for our legal status because of what Jesus has done. So there's four questions. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. Will God give us all things? He will. Who can bring a charge? No one. Who can condemn? No one. And now Paul's going to pivot. He's pivoting this language from law to love. Given our status, given the security of our status, what does this mean now for our experience as believers? Even during adoption, we talked about the legal status of adoption and also the experience of adoption. Okay, he's making the same pivot again. So let's continue on. Pardon me. Verses 35 and 36. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written. Paul's quoting Psalm 44. For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. 
So here's the next rhetorical question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer is no one. And then Paul lists all of these things because he's established the security of the status of the believer. Okay, we have right standing with God, but you think maybe now there might be some things in life that could stop or block God's love for me. And he lists some of them. Let's look at this list. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, shall these horrible things in life or famine or nakedness, that's poverty. Nakedness is even like a a shameful poverty, the shame of poverty or danger or sword. And then he lists Psalm 44. Psalm 44 is when God's people are being killed because they love him. Shall any of these things separate us from the love of Christ. And let's see what he says in verse 37. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Interesting choice of words. Some translations say super conquerors. We are super conquerors. Through him who loved us. Through Jesus. Not because we are great, because he is gracious. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is pushing language to its limits. Can anything come in the way? We are more than conquerors of famine, of distress, of persecution, of violence, of suffering. Not only that, we have ultimate victory over these things, but verse 28 tells us that these things work together for our good. Not only do we conquer it, it works together for our good. Let me prove this to you. Let me show you. If you are a Christian, you are secure in God's love regardless of the chaos inside of you, and the chaos outside of you. If God has decided to love you, if you are in Christ, he has, there is nothing you can do to make him love you anymore because he already loves you fully and completely with the love that he has for Jesus. And he doesn't just love you now, he always will. God loves you no matter what bad stuff is happening inside of you, and he loves you no matter what bad stuff is happening outside of you. Sometimes, sometimes, (laughs) many times, We do awful stuff. We discover new parts of ourselves. We say, oh my word, I had no clue I was capable of that. And we're frustrated with ourselves. We're disappointed and angered and disgusted. And we think, maybe God doesn't love me after doing that. Or maybe everything's going wrong and I think God doesn't love me. If he did, he wouldn't let this stuff happen to me. Your business begins to fail. Someone you care about gets sick. Maybe someone betrays you and hurts you. Maybe one of your children begins to drift. And these circumstances may tempt us to turn from God, but they never tempt God to turn from us. We say, look at what a mess my life is. Obviously, God has abandoned me. Obviously, God hasn't loved me. And Paul says, oh yes, God can still love you. There is still a loving God. That's why he says in verse 28, all things work together for good for those who love God. Because why? Taken together looked at from a whole, all things are being worked together for our good and for God's glory. The outcome is the same, regardless of the specifics in the here and now. Let me give you an example. Look at the place of Dothan. In the Old Testament, it says place, I think it it means two wells, with the place of two wells. Uh, It's still around today, those two wells, I believe. Look at the, the example of Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers at the place of Dothan. He was trapped, thrown into a pit or a well. um, And in that place, he prays that God would deliver him, would protect him, would not allow him to go through these things. And there's no immediate, loud response. You hear silence and he's sold into slavery. Now, consider the example a couple centuries later of Elisha. Elisha was in Dothan, it's a city by now, and it was besieged by an enemy, and he feels that they're about to be overrun and conquered. And he prays to God to be saved. God sends chariots of fire, and uh, it wipes out the invading army, and everybody's saved. Now at the outset, who does it look like God loves more? 
Who is God being more gracious to? Does it seem like God likes one of these people more than the others? Elisha got chariots of fire and Joseph was sold into slavery. It's tempting to think, well, okay, one of these guys got the better deal out of this. But if you know the story of Joseph, if he hadn't have been sold into slavery and gone through those years of misery, not only would thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people perish from starvation and the famine, but even the, the sin of his brothers perhaps could have torn apart his family there and then. God was actively working everything together for their good and for his glory in the lives of Joseph and Elisha. He's always active. He's active in the slow and non-seeming answer of Joseph, and he's active in the spontaneous and fantastic and dramatic response of Elisha as well. He's always present. Paul says it's always the case. God is absolutely, infallibly, unchangeably loving you. He makes this grand statement and he pushes language to its absolute limits to show us how all of these things will not get in the way of God loving us. This is the love you've been looking for all of your life. God has conquered the world with his love. And now we respond and conquer the world with his love as well. And so we view the, the, the chaos in our lives in a different way. All of these things, famine and hunger and destruction, destruction and trials and persecution and tribulation. We view it with a different perspective. Do you know what it's like when you're watching a sports game? And it's really close. It's neck and neck. And everyone's literally sitting on the end of their seats. And we're yelling whenever, you know, there's a goal or it comes close or a bad call happens. Or maybe you're watching the news and something terrible is taking place in real time. And you're terrified and you don't know what's going to happen next. Okay? Keep that in mind and compare that to watching the History Channel. When it's 2 a.m., I'm watching the History Channel. If it's a World War II documentary, it might show, you know, that the, the Nazi regime, Germany, you know, makes a little bit of an advance in the battle. I'm unfazed. I'm sitting with ice cream, half a tub deep. I'm like, yeah, enjoy it while you can, mustache guy, right? Unfazed. Why? Because I already know what's going to happen. Right? I am not as troubled by the back and forth, how close it might look on paper, how hard it might be for the allies in different times. I'm not worried they're going to lose because I already know the outcome. This is the posture, the position of us in this same place. As chaotic as it may seem, we can trust that we are secure in God's love and all things work together for our good and his glory. So Paul asks us at the start, what then shall we say to these things? But I ask you, What then shall you say? What will you say to all of this? No one can be against me. God will give me everything I need to run the race well. No one can bring a charge against me. No one can condemn me. This is what God is inviting you into, to live in the light of and the joy of and the assurance of. And do you see the beauty of this? Or are you like the person in the restaurant on their phone, oblivious to what's happening. I confess, some days, some days I'm like the person on the phone. I know these glorious truths and I don't always respond as I ought to. And so I confess this to God as well. And so I would like to use this, this next minute as an opportunity for us to respond, to reflect, to confess to these things, these glorious things that we've seen. Let's reflect on the assurance of our security, the assurance of God's love and the assurance that all things will work together for our good and for his glory. Confess where I view the hard things in my life as God punishing me and not The fact that God's working all things together for my good and for his glory. So will we take a minute? And how will you respond to this? What will you say to these things? Would God work in our hearts? Show us where we're still acting as we ought not to be. And if you're viewing all this and you're not sure where you stand with God, what will you say to these things? Will you let the Son of God make you a child of God? Will you choose to follow him? Will you give him your sin? Would you... Would you pray about this? Would you ask God to reveal himself to you, to work in your heart today? 
So let's take a few moments, reflect on this, ask the Spirit to illuminate these things to us, to work in our hearts, that He would speak to us today.